powerful lines in, in, in the contemporary gospel. Uh, stop fighting a battle or stop fighting a fight yes. that's already been won. Amen. 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 And I think that's true, uh, Scott, on so many levels. We, Lord, we fight so hard to get God's will done. Yeah. And really, He just wants us to sit still and yeah. let Him work. He wants us out of the way as much as He wants us involved. You know, because we'll get involved all in the wrong ways. We, we think because He says go and do it, that means we've got to get in. And if He wants a church built, we think we've got to start buying block and laying mortar and pouring concrete and putting walls up. And really, He just says, no, I just... I, just, I, I had that covered. I just, I just need you to... Would you... Stop. <laughs> stop. I just wanted you to go leave the singing. I didn't need you to go to wall. And you know, we do that so often. We fight so hard Amen. for what God, you know, we want to be involved and we want to do it all. Yeah, we're doing it for God's glory. Yeah, you get some glory out of it. But there's a difference between saying, Lord, what is your will for my life and fighting to get it done than to turn around and say, Lord, what is your will? And I will adjust my life to it. To it. Amen. Amen. You know, that, that we fight so hard to, to be who we are, so to speak. And, and keep and, and do for God, but really God says, listen, I don't just come get involved with me. It's not what is your the will for your life, but what is your will and I will adjust my life to it. And like what Henry Blackaby says, he said, see where God is working and adjust yourself to it. Amen. You know, the, the recognition of somebody with a flat tire is God's opening my eyes to work needing to be done, Scott. Yeah. The fact that there's somebody with a light bill that needs to be paid or somebody with a sick loved one in the hospital, that's that that's it. God don't have to tell me to go. That's my invitation to go. Amen. You know? And uh it, it's just like it's like anything else. You know, he don't have to tell me not to murder people. He already told me once. Thou shalt not kill. He don't have to tell me again not to murder people. Amen. He already told me to show love and compassion and have charity. He don't have to tell me again. When I recognize people in need, I automatically need to begin to adjust my life to it. Amen? Amen. We're going to have prayer. 73. Bless you, Lord. Don't know exactly where God's going to take us tonight, but I will give credit where credit is due. I ran into the pastor of Victory Baptist Church last night at Not Central Graduation and Brother Reginald Hall. He said, go home and read Psalm 73. And he said, uh, and when you get down, he said, uh, read verse 17. He said, when he changes his perspective. And I said, I'll do that. And he made some comment, and I said, I just might preach that tomorrow night. And I said, that's semi-joking. And I read that earlier today, and I said, yep, it looks like we're going to preach that tonight. So I want to give credit to Brother Reginald Hall for bringing this to my uh, attention. Love Brother Red, Brother Red, you're Victor Baptist, you're the man of God. I mean, you'll have church right along when we get an exam room together. Uh, how many struggle with the fact that you struggle and other people don't? Amen? How many struggle with the fact that some people don't seem to have no battles and they got it all good and here we're trying to do the right thing and they're doing the wrong thing and it's all going right for them and wrong for us? Can we say amen? Amen. amen. Yeah. Oh, uh, Oh, Asaph, he had the same problem. That's who wrote this point. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. So he said, yeah, God's good to his people. He said, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. You hear it? Already he's starting. We, we, we know how good God is, but we start bemoaning our own problems. Can we say amen? I ain't going to pick on her graphing and complaining because I'm right amongst the rest of us. He said, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. We about fell. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. In other words, he said, you know, it really bothered him. And I've, I've seen Christians who struggle with the point, right, that, that the world seems to be prospering and we seem to be getting nothing. But yet we serve a God that we often claim and say will give us the desires of our heart. 
and he'll meet their needs. We know what King David said. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed bag of bread. But yet, here we, we see Christians having foreclosures and we see Christians losing their jobs. We see homes being broken up and we see families being torn apart. And we see drug addiction rampant in our communities. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, come on. Yeah. We, we, can, we can just add on to the list. We've got a soapbox of things we like to hit on on a regular basis. And he's seen this and he said, I was envious to the fact that the world didn't seem to have no death and the world didn't seem to have no limits. Glory. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Does it sound familiar? I mean, we, we've been there. If we're not there now, we've been there before. Amen? Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They're covered with pride. They can be violent to others and each other, and it don't seem to matter. The fatness of eyes, that's, that's an interesting statement. I guess you can take that both ways. Number one, they're prospering in the world. And number two, whatever they're desiring, they get. Whatever they're lusting after, they have. They have no limits. <laughs> they have more than heart could wish. Ain't that interesting? Ain't we done that? How many times he said, I wish I had just a little bit of that money? I wish I had just a little bit of that right there. There's a, there's a mansion out, out on one of the roads coming into town, and he, you know I like to have a fraction. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Just a fraction of that. Somebody said, I like to have a Corvette. I said, I like to have the money to buy a Corvette. I'd do something else with it. You know? <laughs> you kick the Corvette, I'll just take the cash. But that's, but, that, but, but just think about that. right Here's this guy saying, look, we're like 3,000 years ago, and this guy's complaining about the same things that we complain about now. Amen? We couldn't, if we were poetic, maybe we could have gotten out about like he did, but we say this all the time. <laughs> they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are run out of them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge? Listen to that. How doth God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? How many times have we questioned God? God, are you really fair? It goes back to 2 Peter 3 9, where he says he's not slack in the way other men count slackness, but he is long suffering that every man might be saved. And see, what we fail to recognize is while that he was tolerant with us during our down times and our sinful times, he's tolerant with them in their times of prosperity because he's working to bring us all, whether rich or poor or successful or not, back to the throne of grace. Amen. But here this man is questioning all this. I mean, you, you think about this. He, he's talking about them coming up and 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 they they are have more, they're wringing waters out of their cup runneth over from the bad side, not the good side. You know what I'm saying? They have more than the world can offer. And, and, they, and they say, listen, and they say, he didn't say the people of God say, he said they say, how doth God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? And you think about how many people now that even question, I had a lady tell me the other day about a fifth grader at a local school who got bullied by some kids, and he got bullied by some kids because he told those kids there was no God, that he didn't believe in God. And of course, around here, that'll get most people, that'll probably get you bullied by adults in the right in the in the right time of the, of the, of the, or the right place and time, you know, and those kids, one kid I reckon told him he's going to hit him if he didn't confess it was a God, but, you know, but you know, you think about that, even our small children are beginning to question and ask, and here, why wouldn't they? You know, Frederick Nietzsche, this, this German philosopher, or whatever he was from, uh, what, the 1800s, even made a statement, he said, for all the modern purposes of man, God is dead. And that's not an exact quote, but that's pretty, pretty close. And what that means is if we become so successful with our own personal gain and we begin to forget the fact that we even need God to be involved. I can, if I want it, Brother Josh, I can get up and make it happen. You know, we do it all the time. I'll just work harder. I'll work more hours. I'll make more money. I'll sell this. I'll make that happen. Glory, you know what I'm talking about. We'll, we'll, we'll do whatever brown it takes. We'll feed our addictions any way we got to feed them. We'll sacrifice our families any way we got to sacrifice them in order to make ourselves happy. Yeah. 
Cheryl Crow said it great in the 1990s when she said, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. Maybe that was in the early 2000s. It was a quote out of the song. And that's the way people live their lives. Yeah. And, 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 and that is totally what this man was seeing from the side of the world. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily. I want you to listen to this. I read this and I thought, wow. Wow. How many of us have felt this way at some point in time? I said, verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. Hmm. What have I done? Why did I even bother serving God? Why did I even bother trying to do this, Sister Rhonda? It's not even worth the fight. Can you say amen? amen. You know what I'm talking about? You know what, Lord? I could have done this without you. I could have got hungry without you, God. I could have went bankrupt without you, God. I could have lost my family without you, Lord. I, here I've served you, and it's all been for vain. And that's what that guy just said there in that sentence. He said, what have I even tried for? I've tried to live a good life and I've got nothing to show for it. And washed my hands in innocency. In other words, he said, I've cleaned myself up again without even knowing better. If I'd have known better, if I'd have known this is what it was, I wouldn't have done it. For all the day long, I have been plagued and chastened every morning. How many of you feel like you just battle from day in to day out? How many of you got things in your side you couldn't get rid of? Paul said, I have prayed thrice for this thorn to be removed from my side, and the only answer I get is my grace is sufficient for thee. And you think about that for a minute. And we, we're battled all day, Josh. There's, time, there's times that I get out of bed and my mind is a mess from the time my eyes open up to the time I lay down at night. And there's days that it about drives me wild, and I like to beat my head on the wall and, and, to, and to get it out and straighten it up, and Brown, he just don't seem to stop. And there's other days I feel like I got the world by the tail and I can't be defeated. And there's other days I wonder, and I, I went through this several years ago when, when the, the, the business that I'm in was changing hands and all this was going on, and I was watching the people that I thought was my enemies and the people that I thought had done me wrong, and they seemed to be prospering, and I was barely getting by, and I was angry, and I was bitter. And you know what? I, at times I probably felt a little bit like this guy. Lord, what is it? why? How? What's the purpose of it all? Hmm. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. In other words, he said, if I tell everybody this, they're going to get mad at me. You know, if I talk about them this way, like they're doing wrong, and it's all in makes that they're going to get mad at me. And I, and I like 16 and 17. It all hinges right there. He said, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Did you hear that? And that goes back to verse 2 where he says, My feet were almost gone and my steps had well nigh slipped. He said, It was too painful for me. The realization that the world was prospering and he had served God for naught, he thought, was too much for him. It consumed him. He was about ready to let go. Have you been battled to the point that you thought about giving up. You know, we were talking about this on Friday night. And I'll get to 17 in a minute. But we were talking about this on Friday night. And, and coincidentally, coincidentally, we, we were talking about a very high profile situation in the news and about how this person has completely changed. It's the word I'm looking for. And uh, has completely changed. And I said, what is really sad? God said this, not me. I'm not this smart. This is a God thing. But the Lord brought out the point that what was really sad about that is that he had struggled in his mind for all those years with this problem, even confessing to his first wife that he was struggling with his identity. And then at the age of 65, he gives up. You think about it for a minute. He gives up. Yeah, I know we can say a lot, and I'm not trying to get on that person particularly, but I want you to think for a minute what you see in that is a man who give up. You see a man who finally said, 
the rest of this is in vain. All my struggles are in vain. All that I've done is in vain. Everything that I've done is not worth it. This battle in my mind ain't worth it. I'm letting it all go. And you see, we see Christians like that all the time. For whatever reason, we come to a point in our life when the battle gets too big, so we think, and we disregard what the Word of God says, where He said, if you're tempted beyond what you, will, you can bear, I will make a way of escape. Amen. But we, we don't see the escape. We don't understand, glory to God, that on the cross, Christ Himself reached a low point, Brother Josh, where He needed a way of escape. And you're what he, hey, Hebrews said that He was tempted in every like manner that we were tempted. And you say, well, if He was tempted like me, then He was tempted to give up and He was tempted to let go. And I'm going to tell you the Word of God, I can find it because He hung on the cross and He was stretched arm to arm and He began to cry out of His mouth. He said, Father, why have you, glory to God, forsaken me? And you see, He hit His low point. Josh, He needed an escape. Glory. He was looking for a way out. He needed that because he was tempted beyond what he could bear. And he found the escape in the death of the body because the Spirit left. God called him home to sit on the right hand of the Father. Right. And you see, we got that kind of escape this evening. Not in death, glory to God, but in the escape of the Holy Spirit and the escape of salvation. And if we will hold on, God will not give us the freedom that we need, glory to God, from the things that battle in our mind. You see, he fought all those years. And he finally said it ain't worth it anymore. And what's really sad is they don't ever come out and say it ain't worth it anymore. They find a way to justify their actions. Well, if I can't control my own thoughts and the way I feel, then it just must be born that way. I must be made that way. And if God didn't make me that way, then there must not be no God. Come on. And, and it don't matter what we're talking about. It don't matter whether it's addiction. I don't care if it's to drugs or pornography. Come on. It, it don't matter. I don't care if you're addicted to sex. Or I don't care if you're addicted to food. Whatever it is, if there's an addiction in your life, we struggle in our mind, Brother Josh. Glory to God. And for me to give up the battle means that I'm giving up on the power of God. Because if I say God can't fix it, then I'm denying that He sent His Son to sit on the cross. That got out of the grave in three days. I'm denying that we were healed by His stripes, as the Word of God said. Because I have to believe. And I'm sure I'm going to be tried because God's been having me preach it too much lately. But I've got to believe that if it says it in the Word of God, that it is real. And it is true. And I will not back up. And if he tells me that I got a way of escape, Blake, then there's a doorway to wait with my name on it. And a big pretty knob that I can turn to get out in a hurry. Come on. And I gotta believe that there's an addiction in my mind that it needs to go. That if I will hang on, my God is just to deliver me from what I can't conquer on my own. I don't want to be one of the sad ones. Come on, one of the lost ones that say the battle ain't worth fighting anymore. See, we begin to question people around us. We begin to question motives. I've seen my family destroyed by the fact that my grandfather never made right for abusing them. Come on. Destroy them. Josh, at least some of them, because they can never come to terms with a man who was a preacher that never made right with his family. <clears throat> Come on. <clears throat> and so instead of hanging on and fighting the fight, even though that they didn't understand, I ain't justifying nobody. My grandfather was wrong and what he done. But instead of turning to God and hanging on, they turned to the bottle and destroyed their lives. They give up the fight. It wasn't worth it anymore. It wasn't worth the fight anymore. I've seen families tore apart. Because people didn't think it was worth it anymore. <coughs> Just ain't worth doing anymore, sister. There's no escape. We see people take their lives all the time because of battle. Yeah. Ain't worth it anymore. That's right. Going to school one more day and being picked on. Yes, sir. 
ain't worth it anymore. Feeling this pain in my body, bro. One more day ain't worth it. My knee started hurting me yesterday. I had surgery on it a few years ago, and it's been pretty good. I don't know why I've done some two, three weeks ago. It hurt, and I come down a set of stairs last night in the gym, and it popped. If boy hadn't have been standing there, I grabbed a hold of. Luckily, I knew him. I said we'd have probably had a real interesting meeting right off the bat right there. But I grabbed a hold of him and said, just hug me a while, Ty. And uh, I held on to him, and it popped and ground. And you know, I could begin to question God. Josh would say, Lord, what, what is it you want me to do with a bad knee? Why do I have to face this again, God, where that it's hard for me to stand up and get down, up and down out of the floor? And, and they diagnosed me with asthma a few months ago. i got a God bigger than that, but there's days I catch my breath short. And you know, I could say, God, I like my lungs awful good. And I could sing awful loud, awful long, and I could preach awful good and long, but Lord, why would you take my lungs? And I'm going to tell you something. He'll take anything you got pride in, number one. But number two, He don't need my body to get His glory. And if I will but hang on, if I lose all four limbs, and all but just enough lung to make a noise. If I will continue to praise his name, Brother Josh, he will get the glory out of my life. I don't need my health. Come on. I don't need no money. Come on. I just need yeah. the love of God in my heart to be able to do the work yeah. of God. I will keep Jesus and let the world go by. Yeah. I don't care how much prosperity there is running back and forth. And I don't care how much that I think I need a new car or a new house or a new set of clothes. The only thing I really got to have is Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Glory. Yeah. Glory to God. And here this old fellow's bemoaning the whole fact that the world's doing good and he's not. Can you say amen? Amen. And I love what it said in 17. Until I went into the sanctuary. Until I went. He said all this was bad. I was falling. I was dying. I was ready to give up. Come on. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Glory. You see, Blake? I can't understand. At best, according to Paul, we see through a glass darkly. So I only understand in part and know in part until the end of Corinthians 13. He said to, the, that to until him that comes that is coming, then we're only going to know a part of it anyway. So at best, I'm going to understand half if I'm lucky. Yeah. At best. And he said in Isaiah, he said, my ways are not man's ways. And he said, I believe also in Isaiah, that as high as the heavens is above the earth, my ways are above. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. But until I get it from God's perspective, I'm never going to have the right perspective. Amen. See, I'm not graded on a bell curve, bell curve of sin. So if I'm doing good and Josh is not, then I don't get into heaven because he done bad. And I done better. We're graded on the same scale. And an F is an F. And an A is an A. Really, it ain't even a grade. It's a matter of pass-fail. Amen. Yeah. Hey you either in or you out. Yeah. Hey Amen. It's a pass-fail type of thing. Come on. And see, we grade ourselves based on other people's sin. Lethan, we look and say, well, I'm doing better than all them over there. Come on. And we just got a few people on this side that we think we're not doing as good as. Yeah. But that's nearly not as big as number as that people on the other side. Yeah. But see... Not only do we ever judge our righteousness that way or our lack of sin that way or our amount of sin that way, yeah. but we also judge our worldly gain that way. Yeah. I'm not as rich as these people and I'm not as poor as them people. I've been pretty good. And I don't have desires or wants in my heart like those people. I don't have as many as those people. And I've been pretty good. But you see, glory to God, we're not put on a bell curve with God. Yeah. He's got a flat line that we live upon. <laughs> and you see, I can't even begin to understand. I can look at the world and it will confuse me. I can look at the world and say, I don't understand why child molesters walk the street and their victims hide in the shadow. I, I don't understand why the drug addicts can destroy lives Come and on. nothing ever happened to them. But yet a child getting bullied at school will get put in jail 
or someone doing the bullying in jail, jail at school will be taken to jail. Which don't get me wrong, they didn't do something about the bullying, but the, but the perspective's off. We condemn cigarettes to the point that nobody will pick one up, on. but yet we're encouraging smoking pot. Come on. And I know what the Word said. He said there'd come a time where they called evil good and good yes, evil. Sir. And he said, he, and Paul wrote, and he said, whose only glory is their shame. I know those things, Brother Nelson, but I only know those things because I have a perspective inside the sanctuary of God. Brother Bright, if I look how the world is doing compared to how I'm doing, Josh, I'm losing the race and I'm not doing good. If I'm trying to keep up, Sister Rhonda, then I'm going to fall behind with God. And if I think I'm failing compared to the world, standard that I'm never going to do any good Lisa. but I'm not measured by the same measurement of the world but I'm measured by the measurement of God and His grace and His glory and His righteousness and until I get inside the sanctuary of God I can never get that perspective Lord I don't need the perspective of the world because the perspective of the world brings us to where this man was where his feet was on a slippery slope and he was thinking I even started serving God for nothing he said, until I went into the sanctuary of God. And listen, listen to those last five words. Then understood I their end. He said, then I understand their end. See, when I get the right perspective, then I can see where the world is going. Surely, Thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. For all we see them as prosperity, God sees them as failing. Wasn't it during the parable of the rich man that he begged Lazarus, Abraham, to let Lazarus come and dip him? And Abraham made a comment to him along the lines of the fact that that some have their blessings and their treasures down here. Oh. Amen. And some get them over young. Yes, sir. <laughs> Think about that, church. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment. A moment they're brought into desolation. They are utterly consumed. With tears. Lord, if I go there, it's going to get ugly. I'm going to tell you something. And I'm not sitting here saying that walking a Christian life is easy. Far from it. I'm not going to tell you that I ain't got battle crap because I got them. And I'm not going to tell you we ain't got depressed Christians. Come on. I ain't going to tell you that we ain't got sick Christians. I ain't going to tell you that we ain't got Christians who are struggling on a daily basis. Come on. But I'm going to tell you what. If the worldly side was so good, they wouldn't have a suicide rate. Come on. If the worldly side was so good, they wouldn't have a divorce rate. If the worldly side was so good, they wouldn't be child molesters. And there wouldn't be pornography. Come on. If the worldly side was good, we wouldn't have drug addicts and alcoholics. Can you say amen to see you? Come on. You see, when you get the perspective, you realize that those people are slated for destruction. And if they don't get it on this side of the grave, Lord God, there's a judgment coming. Brother Josh, where they're going to get it, Brother Nelson. Come on. And it ain't a, it ain't a, it ain't a me saying, oh, glory me, look, I get out of it. And oh, poor pitiful them. Let me tell you, it's something that I ought to fall on my face and weep and cry about because of all to be like 2 Peter 3 9. Where I ought to be long suffering and want to see those people come to the throne of God. Hey, Lord, I don't want to see nobody go to hell. I want them all to come with me to glory. But if the world was so good and the perspective on it was so awesome, then why are we even bothered with this? Why are they looking for something more? And why are they never satisfied? Let me tell you, when I found Jesus, when I got inside the sanctuary, I got satisfied. My addictions were taken care of. Glory to God. And my wants were taken away. I didn't need nothing that the world had to offer. I just needed Jesus. You see, they're headed for destruction and some of them don't even know the better. And that is the sad thing because we've got it and we ought to be up proclaiming what the truth is. Yes. But I want to tell you, hallelujah, glory to God, if it was so good, they wouldn't be looking for something more than what they've got right now. Amen. 
Christian or not, they look for the same answers we look for. Yeah. They want to know why some are rich and some are poor. They want to know why that some are happy and some are depressed. Come on, they want to know that why some people are born child molesters, they say. And why that some people are born homosexuals, they say. They want to know why that some people are born kleptomaniacs. They're looking for answers. The same way you and I are looking for answers. They want to know what happens to life after death. Come on. They want to know where we come from. And they want to know where we're going. And I'm going to tell you, Brother Scott, if they had the answers, they wouldn't be looking. Can you say amen this evening? But I'm going to tell you, we've got the answers. And I've got the book that's got them in it. And we say, do you understand it? I just told you at best, I'm only going to get half figured out of my life. At best, I'm only going to get half. But I understand enough to know that my God is in charge. And my God is in control. Glory to God. And that He's a just God. And that if I'll call on the name of Jesus, that I can be saved and forgiven for my sins. Come on. And that I can have peace and tranquility in my mind. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Yeah, we got our struggles. Amen? Amen. But if we're serving God the right way, my happiness and my peace ought to be far above the happiness and the yeah. peace that the world has. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And if it's not, Jeez. perhaps we ought to reevaluate that. Yeah. Come on, dude. And I'll talk about us on a group curve for a minute, just as a group. The group of the world should not have as high marks in peace and happiness as the Christian group should. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that some will have their struggles on their side, like some will have their struggles on our side. We're people, we're imperfect. But if we're not serving God to the point that we can achieve what the Word of God promises us, then we've got a problem. <coughs> The church world ought to be happier and more content with less than the world. Amen. Yes, amen. 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 You think about that a minute. But yet, instead of... I like what Brother Scott said about Brother Parcel. Brother Parcel's from here in Mark. <laughs> he said they remembered they went into a bare room and screwed the light bulb in the ceiling. And they had church. I got some missionary friends in Ecuador. Sister Perry's been down here to church. People don't even have hot water tanks, man. Come on. They get a little electric water head you screw on there. He's supposed to heat the water and it comes out. One change of clothes. Two, maybe if they're lucky. Eating a whole lot of rice and tortillas. A flour bread, something very basic. Happier and cunning to the poor man. <coughs> They're not dealing with depression down there. Come on. They're not dealing with people asking what their purpose is in life. And they're not dealing with people who's trying to gain. They're dealing with people who have nothing by our standards. So they work all day to make a block of cheese, sell it for two dollars, and they're happy. Why? that two dollars feeds them tonight and in the morning that's all they need you see what I'm saying they're not after big mansions and big homes they're not after the thrills of life they just enjoy living Amen. and that's not the Christian one that's the society that's that's a society that community that they're getting down there as a whole that's Ecuador at least that section up in the mountains that's what they're dealing with they're, they're not they're not tore up by worldly gain one lady in their ministry there who's doing a lot of cooking, she's got seven kids. Her and her husband's married young. I think they said seven kids, all under the age of ten. And her husband died three years ago, and she's providing, trying to provide for them and them seven kids. Got one change of clothes apiece, but they're always clean. <coughs> Come on, man. And I ain't criticizing nobody because, Lord, I know if I lost my spouse over here, you'd all die. Uh, short of me giving down to, getting down to the throne of God, you're going to have to pick me up off the floor. 
You know, but that lady's lost. And how many people here would lose a spouse and loved one and our world comes to a screeching halt? Children or not. But then people just get up and they go on. They roll with life. They have something that Christians lack. Come on. They have a contentment in the small things. They have a contentment in the little things. They have a contentment, dare I say, in the real things. Yeah. <coughs> Brother Ricardo said he can't get church started on time. He said, because you're telling me starting at 7, he said everybody rolls in at 7, between 7 and 7.30, and he said if there's 40 people in the building, everybody walks in and walks around and hugs everybody else's neck. And they don't just shake their hands and keep quiet, but they're kissing each other on the cheek, and they're hugging one another, and they're talking about their day, and how have you been, and I ain't seen you in a while. And he said, you don't get started at 8 o'clock. He said, by the time everybody gets in, and gets through greeting each other. And he said, if you're on your way to meet somebody, and, and you run into somebody else to talk to, it don't matter that you told them that you'd be there at 12. If you run into somebody to talk to on the way and you get there at 2, that's fine. Because you see, they're worried more about the relationships with their people than they are about the relationship in the world. Amen. They're worried more about their families and their friends Come on. and the people around them than they are making their world the game. And you see, when you get a perspective from inside the sanctuary, you see that you're all my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I should be more worried about your blessings and your health than I am my own. Amen. Glory to God. And I should be more respectful of your time than I am my own. And I should be more worried about taking care of my family than I should making money and putting it in my pocket. Sometimes people ask me, why don't I work more? <coughs> because I've got a family. Amen. And the money that I can bring in ain't worth losing time with my children. Amen. Don't get me wrong. Thank you for what I've got. My daddy didn't have the fortune, didn't have the fortunate situation to be able to do that decision. He had to work. And he had to work hard. He had to work long. And as time that it seemed a lot, Scott, because he was working and it was all right. That's what my daddy had to do. And if I was having to do that, then there'd be nothing wrong with that. But glory to God, I'm in a position where I can step away from that a little bit and be able to be there a little more for my children. I wish I'd have thought of this a few years ago and would have even been happier in one way than I am now because I missed a lot of things with them. But glory to God, Brian, it ain't about the amount of money I make. Amen. It ain't about the kind of car I drive. Amen. It ain't about the kind of house I live in. <laughs> oh, and those things are fine. I'm glad if you got them and more power to you and pour it on you. But if that's the pride in your heart, <coughs> then that's what's standing between you and God. Amen. Amen. I liked what Rhonda said a while ago. Are you willing to be stripped down of everything but God? Come on. Christ, glory. I'll say this and try to move on. Christ was stripped of everything but God. Amen. Amen. He laid down His power he laid down His divinity. Come on. And He laid down all the power that He was to pick up a fleshly body. And let me just tell you, that was a serious downgrade. Yeah. From where, for all he, you think He might have gained from picking up... No, no, no. He'd been better off just probably not picking up anything at all than picking up old filthy man. But not only did He lay down His kingship, the Word says that nothing was made without Him. And all made, things were made through and by Him. And all things were created for Him. And He laid all that down and stepped down here on earth. But it didn't stop there. Yeah. Because He still had a little of His own self-pride and dignity. He wasn't arrogant, but He was a good man. And He done wonderful things for people. I understate Good and wonderful. Come on. He was beyond good and wonderful. But you know what I'm driving at. But they wasn't satisfied until they stripped away everything that he had. Yeah. And so they began by stripping away his testimony. Boy, I didn't see this coming. Come on. And they began, Brittany, by stripping away his testimony. And, and, and then they started making fun of him. Yeah. And started pulling at his dignity. But they didn't satisfy him until they got to beat him and they maimed his body. Mm -hmm. 
And so he lost. And Isaiah says maybe he wasn't all that good looking anyways, but they, they maimed him to the point that he was humiliated. And that didn't satisfy him, but they destroyed his body that he couldn't hardly move. And that didn't satisfy him. So they put thorns inside of his head and drove him down. And they made fun of him. And then that didn't satisfy him. And they nailed him to a tree. And that didn't satisfy him until they had ripped his clothes off. And there he hanged in naked shame in front of everybody bleeding and dying on a cross with everything that a fleshly man could hold dear was ripped away and running down the base yeah. of the cross. Glory to God. But the only thing that they hadn't stripped him of was the Christ from the God that lived on the inside of him. Thank Glory. Are you willing to be stripped away to nothing but you and God? I often think about the Jews in the concentration camps. Tattooed. Had a number. Attracted them. They lost their individuality. They wasn't a name, they were a number, they didn't care. Then they made them run naked in them camps, Josh. Come on. Be simple, be real with you, man. I can't imagine standing in a camp of 3,000 people and nobody not having no clothes on. Me included. I can't imagine being a guard and having to see all that, let alone be in that stripped of everything they had? Are you willing to be stripped of everything you have and let God rule and reign in your life? Will it cost you your family? Well, sometimes. Will it cost you your life? Never bit of it. I don't say that in a bad way. Because inside being stripped down to God, is the greatest peace and satisfaction yes, that a man can ever come on. Amen. Glory to God. It's worth losing everything to keep my God. Amen. He said, if I gain the whole world and lose my soul. Come on, you think about it tonight. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, for I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was a beast before thee. He says, Lord, how have I been so foolish to thank God that they were prospering and me trying to live for you with the sense their heart was failing. How could I be so foolish and ignorant and unlearned, God, that, that I'm just like a beast, Lord, and we know how dogs and beasts are. Ain't none of us got anything but dogs anymore. Maybe a horse. Ain't, ain't nobody got ox or anything that we'd call a beast. But they just, you know, they, they don't understand. There's only a certain level of comprehension. People say, you're a vet, Sean. You shouldn't say that. I'm sitting here telling you they ain't got the IQ of a human. I don't mean that mean. They don't think on that level. They can't. And he says, I'm like a beast. I, I'm just, I was ignorant to the fact, God, that here I'm watching the world do good and thinking that they're prospering and me sincerely was failing serving you. How foolish was I? He said, I was pricked in my reins. In other words, in my heart, God convicted me that I was foolish. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand, by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Do you think he was stripped down to nothing but him and God? Amen? <clears throat> my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Boy, I tell you what, we can preach on that alone. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart Amen. and my portion. Well, heard about a man last night whom I've been praying for over the years. I've never met him personally, but 
his family and I had prayed several times that he'd had kidney transplants, one thing or another. He went back up in ICU and eventually he had a stroke. And he was going, the family knew it was going, the doctors knew it was going, and they said, okay, he's, we know. And they said a few hours before he died, he went totally incoherent. <coughs> he said he woke up and he looked at one of them and looked at his daughter and he said, what are you doing here? She said, well, I've been here the whole time. And said he rolled his head back over, his eyes rolled up in his head. And said he opened his eyes and he looked up. And he raised his hands toward heaven. And he began to clap and he pointed. And that was the last thing that came out of him. Brother Josh, glory to God. I like that what he said a couple of verses ahead of that. He said, and afterward, receive me the glory. The strength of that man's heart was the fact that he knew that he had a hand that was reaching across the other side when it was all stripped away but him and God. That that hand was there ready to take him. And he said, I'm coming. I'm coming. Glory to God. That come out of his mouth. He said, I'm coming. I'm coming. Glory to God. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. And thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is God for me to draw near to. It is good for me to draw near to God. Excuse me. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Yeah. Glory to God. Are we ready to be stripped down? I said. Are we ready to stop being defeated and set our eyes on the things of the world and change our perspective and set our eyes on the things of God? Amen. Come on. You know what I'm talking Amen. about. Glory. How about we bow our heads this evening? 